uh, my name is Megan Fernandez, and I'm excited to be reading uh, from my most recent book called Good Boys for Poets House today. I'm going to read a few poems of my own, and then I'm going to read a poem by a poet that I love uh, from who lives in the Netherlands. This is a poem called Why We Drink, and it's a poem about why we drink. I tell Malik I'm going to stop. I tell him that I do it because I am sad and because someone was mean to me at a lecture after five men spoke during the Q&A. So I said something finally about energy and petrocultures and did the infrastructure of the moon landing look just like the oil fields of Alberta. And some older Italian man said no, said I was projecting as if projection were not interpretation, but it was in front of a lot of people. And what was the point of all my degrees and giving up of a decade of life to school if I could be so easily humiliated? And maybe I shouldn't have worn jeans shredded at my thighs or that navy sweater sleeves blooming with moth holes. But if these are our left institutions, if these are the men on our side, I said, then of course I am going to drink. Malik tells me you can't quit before 35 because you're not gonna stay quit. And something about me trusts him because he was at the ear end back when it was the ear end back in the old New York. And he tells me I'm the new New York and I don't even know how to tell him that I'm not even that. I say humiliation is like the nausea of childhood with those delayed epiphanies. I hate the violence of insight. The lesson is always how one is ugly or dishonest, the shortcomings that could build a civilization and then did. Malik is not even so much older, 40 something, but there have been many Maliks and therefore he claims ancientness. He says it's all real, my parents and those men and yes, even the feeble species. He keeps a notebook and writes down all the great Irish bits spiraling out of Helen's mouth at dinner. He sits cross-legged on a pillow, cradles lemons and snacks on pickle, waxes poetic while he assesses the spice level of a green Peruvian sauce I make, which he ranks only a three for spice, but insists is a 10 in taste because he knows I am fragile. He does impressions of nutritionists and people who get jazzed about gym memberships. But I know that we are laughing that he's really sad. Sad that this is the theater of his multitasking, that the corruptions are multiplying faster than our jokes. So we have become creatures who can slip through dimensions. Our time's thick with simultaneity. So ready we are to be brutalized many times a day, even with laughter. Malik says, maybe it's time to leave New York. He can tell we're all getting tilted there. And by that, he means becoming products paralyzed by false moonlight in the streets. I tell Malik, I drink because I am tired and because they hate us anyway. And we are outside while others smoke at the opening of the red wheelbarrow in Paris. And I'm wearing a polka dot dress and I forgot to put on a bra this morning and it is freezing and I see myself, the mess of my complaints and temperatures, the way I am not making any sense these days. He says, yes, and yes, and yes. He keeps saying it's all okay, all real, tells me to turn my insights into contents, into paintings, get sloppy, delicate, be a feral amateur. When I get back to New York, he's the only one I still talk to on the regular. He says, listen to this and read this. And his brain is so addicted to joy. And we both get nominated for a prize in the same week and it works. It really does work. The way his spirit skims octaves across the ocean into my heart, into this poem, the way he said my Jesus here now that I'm 33 is going to reveal something about me, which it just did. And do you know, this time the revelation didn't hurt so much, which is what Malik might call aging, a process not nearly as dire as they want you to believe. So I'm going to read the title poem of the collection called uh, Good Boys. Once in a car, a good boy shook me hard. If you like it that way in bed, then why are you? The tiny bruises on my arms where his prints pressed into my pink sleeves rose to the surface like rattles, like requests. They thrived there for a week until they settled into a wet blackness. A bruise can sweeten your blood, can bloom the sweetness into you. A bruise can bloom rabbits like pines. Once in a car, everything between us started growing. And then I was not in the car or the state or the East Coast anymore. I was at the summit of a prayer reeling from an animal mouth, my tongue an unseeable act because here is the truth. Even the good boys wanna shake you down, wanna come in your mouth and hair, wanna quake above you if only for a moment come home 
Come home, another good boy says. I would never shake you. I would never do anything to your body. Um, I am going to read a poem in progress from my new book coming out, also with Tin House, in, gosh, I believe it's June of next year, um, and it's called Orlando, and I've just been thinking about, I wrote this, like, I think the night, the first draft, the night of the Supreme Court ruling on Roe v. Wade, and um, yeah, just, I woke up in the middle of the night and just got the first draft out and I'm still working on it. So I'd like to share this rather vulnerable poem uh, cause you know, the other ones weren't vulnerable at all. Um, and this is called Orlando. The few weeks I was pregnant, whenever people asked, how are you Meg? I'd answer, oh, you know, with child, which I thought was dead funny. I don't think about it now, except sometimes in a fitness class surrounded by women trying to shed baby weight. And I make the calculations, he'd be about 14 by now. And then I look at myself in the class mirror while women squat and lift their legs and think, wow, I look so good for having a 14 year old. And then I think again, how if he was a reality, I'd say it all the time and embarrass him in front of his school friends. And for some reason, I think he'd be a drummer and wear green. I have no regrets, but I wonder if he's waiting in the sky somewhere or doing blow in another dimension where he's a rocker and very much flesh. I don't believe in kin by blood, but I believe that poems can give form to the formless, that one can resurrect roads not taken in a line and give it a name. It's a novel by Virginia Woolf, I'd say, and rattle on and he'd wave me off, but maybe read it one day in college and think about his young mother who wanted to be a writer and what she might have given up in order to raise him at 23. He'd write me a song. He'd title it with my name. And I'm going to end with this poem uh, by Radna Fabius, who is a Dutch Caribbean poet. Uh, it's uh, her debut, it's called Habitus, and it is, um, I think it's the one of the best books. I, it's definitely probably the best book of poetry I read last year. Um, and uh, one of the best books I've read, I would say in, in the past five years. So if you are looking for a book that is doing really interesting things with adrenaline and enjambment, um, this is the book for you. And the poem is called The Blackness of the Whole. And I love space poems. Um, I'm obsessed uh, with like space and like, I'm like an amateur space geek. Um, so this is called The Blackness of the Whole. Black holes are weird. Black holes are the strangest objects in the universe. A planet or star has a surface. A black hole is black, so black. A black hole doesn't have a surface. A black hole is an area, a hole in space, an area where matter is compressed and catastrophically collapsed. Cataclysmic. That fatal collapse concentrates an enormous quantity of mass in a very, very, very small area. The gravity in this area is black, very black and strong, so strong nothing can escape it. Light almost always escapes, but not from a black hole. Objects that fall into black holes break everything that falls into the black hole, breaks everything that falls into the black hole, is stretched to breaking point. Once an astronaut came too close to a black hole, he was sucked into it, he was torn apart by the superhuman enormity of the gravity in the hole, let that be a lesson to us, NASA said. We can't see black holes, but we believe in their existence, just like we believe in Jesus. NASA said we believe the black hole because the black hole does things to matter, because the black hole does things to stars, because the black hole does things to the solar systems in the vicinity of the black hole. The black hole doesn't think about it. The black hole acts according to to its nature. The whole is an area in space. The whole is black. The whole is catastrophically collapsed matter. Black, a gravity grave. The whole is often surrounded by disks of matter. The disks rotate in a vortex around the black hole and get god awful hot. 
thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, please support Poets House. It's such an important and special place. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening to poetry today. <laughs>